everybody. Excited to have uh, a return guest, our good friend, Dr. Puya Ali Maram. Playing um, his cards right. Yeah. <laughs> um, from uh, MIT, he's here on holidays, and we got him, and a lot of stuff happening the past few days. Today's January 8th, by the way, just so because it's not gonna, it's probably gonna come out very soon. Um, so we got a lot of stuff to talk about. We got my co host Yaya in the house. Hey, y'all. We just did another episode, we're on fire. So, how's your day? How's your trip? First, let me just say it's really good to see you two again. Yeah, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I wish it was under better circumstances, yeah, that's for certain. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Well, I mean, I don't know, I'm just gonna get right into it. The past, uh, Last night from yesterday afternoon when I heard the attacks uh, that they heard the uh, Ain al-Assad in, uh, in Baghdad and then the other places, I was just like having a heart attack, right? Yeah. Anxiety immediately, all my friends in group chats talking, going back and forth, looking at all the new stuff. Um, but I, as it got closer to the nighttime and then we heard that um, luckily no casualties, no American casualties over there because we didn't want war, you know, no one mm -hmm. really wants, you know. Most of, Most of us don't want war. Me and you don't want yeah, war because yeah. we understand, even though we haven't experienced it firsthand, maybe in a battlefront, yeah. but we understand that a war is not going to be precise. It's going to be destructive of an entire nation. Exactly. A people with you know, 83 million residents inside of it, trapped yeah. inside of yeah. it in a way. Generally, the people who want war, who do want war, is either these like you know certain politicians that we were just talking about in the last podcast too. Um, they, I don't think they been too familiar with the world and real people outside of America and like you know that people's other people's lives matter any basically life outside of America matters you know so that's that's so, another problem you see in the media every time they want to talk about um, an event that's happened that involves Iran most of the people commenting on it are military personnel yeah they either retired or active military personnel and for them it's really just this cardboard image of Iran <laughs> Iran is seen as an enemy, a military conflict. They always forget to, that this is a country of human beings, yeah. 83 million that breathe the same damn air. And um, the narrative in the United States is really kind of controlled by military personnel. Mm -hmm. CNN, and it's not just Fox News, CNN too. Always active or retired officers or former CIA um, operatives. Yeah. That's it. They see you run through that. And for prison. people, I mean, as an, as Americans, when you watch TV and you watch the news, you naturally want to trust in what your countrymen are saying, and you want to believe it. And you know, even even if it's dumb shit like, oh, they just hate our freedom, and that's mm -hmm. why they want to attack. Does it even make sense? People have lives, they have kids to feed, under sanctions, all these things on the other side of the world, and all they're thinking about is your freedom on this side of the world. They want to take it away, or like yeah. shit like that. And it's absurd. Yeah, yeah, it's absurd. And um, anyways, but I, I, as it. Progressed through the night, it felt like, and I'm going to ask your opinion on this, as like, is this like a setup? Is this a conspiracy that both sides kind of know what's happening? And it seems like maybe the Iranians told the Iraqis what's going to happen, and then the Iraqis told the Americans, so they there were no, no soldiers at the base when they attacked, which again is a good thing, but yeah. it, it's, 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 it sucks that they're acting like enemies and they're kind of like maybe possibly doing deals uh, behind the scenes. And um, what's happened is the issue with that, the only issue I have with that is that until last week, we had a lot of protests in Iran last month. A lot of people got killed inside mm -hmm. Iran. And uh, because of this, the whole country is super united, like behind the government against America now because they felt like, oh, they killed, they killed an Iranian official, like General Soleimani. And they want to attack us now. And Trump said a lot of things about cultural sides and blah, mm -hmm. blah, blah. And all these tweets that went back and forth. And now it seems like all of that is lost and everybody's kind of focused on, like, let's be united and, you know. And that's, that's typical, right? So in any country, this isn't unique to Iran. Yeah. When you have a, uh, an outside player um, that is seen as an, as an aggressor, rightfully <laughs> or, unright, or unjustly, that's, I guess, a matter of opinion, um, uh, the country kind of bands together. When 9-11 happened, as an example, um, a lot of Americans didn't understand the entire history behind it. They just saw it as this attack. And it, it, it didn't even matter if you were a Democrat or Republican. Um, mm -hmm. they, people just, you saw the flyers come out. You saw bumper stickers. These colors don't run, you know. Freedom um, fries. Freedom fries. French mm -hmm. fries were changed to freedom fries. And uh, I think it was in the White House, um, Capitol Hill. And uh, 
President Bush at the time had very low approval ratings. Um, he had a crisis with China over a drone that was um, basically brought down and the Chinese refused to hand it over until they basically reverse engineered it. It was very embarrassing for the, uh, for the president. And all of a sudden his approval ratings sk skyrocketed. So this, is, this isn't that unpredictable. In fact, this is what we've been saying. Like if you think that you're going to be able to attack Iran, and even though this attack did not occur on Iranian soil, it's still an attack on Iran. It's this yeah, top it's military, commander, military commander. It's going to anger a lot of people who may or may not like the Iranian government. They're just normal mm -hmm. Iranians who see that as an attack on themselves. Now, I think your question kind of suggested, is this something that maybe the Iranian government may have... Maybe there were some talks like behind the scenes. Uh, just as far as that, okay, you want to get revenge for Soleimani? Maybe oh, there's some option. The attack on the attack on Erbil and the uh, Ain al-Assad areas. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I think that initially what everyone thought was this was uh, an attack from Iran that, well, they first thought it was a rocket attack from Iran's proxies, right? They always call it proxies. Iran yeah. doesn't have allies as proxies. We're the only ones with allies in the region. But I mean, they're just, they're really allies. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so it was a rocket attack, and then there were no casualties. And then, then they discerned that it was actually a missile attack from Iranian territory, and that there were no casualties, so that the Iranians may just be incapable of inflicting real damage. And I wrote this on Twitter. I'm saying, no, I think that the Iranian military it may not have the budget that the United States has, but it's actually very capable. And we know this because it brought down a stealth surveillance drone, a, a U.S. stealth surveillance drone over the summer. That was mm -hmm. th the first time the United States and Iran got very close to war. They brought it down to the shock of the Pentagon. Yeah. They were just they weren't like, expecting it's that a at stealth all. drone. How were the Iranians able to bring <clears throat> this down? They were floored by it. So the capabilities are there. So I, when I heard that there was no casualty, I was, casualties, I was like, no, this is um, a message saying that you have killed our general. You are now saying that we have no right to retaliate. Uh, and if we retaliate, you're going to bomb 52 of our sites, some of which are going to be cultural. And we understand that you're military power. We understand you think you're dom you belong in our region, even though you're not. Yeah. You're two oceans away from your homeland. But we still are going to retaliate, even if it's symbolic. We're, we're not going to take your threats. And that's actually the really ingenious thing of it, is that the Iranians retaliated despite all those threats that President Trump had made and didn't kill anybody. And they said, we, cho we chose not to kill anybody. Mm -hmm. and, and we are <clears throat> demonstrating to you that we have the ability to retaliate without having to kill your people. Yeah. Do you think people in Iran um, are now in a place where they're happy about this? Or do you feel like they feel somewhat tricked and fooled by calling it an, um, I don't know, an act against America while there was, everybody was already in the bunkers and they were already, it seems like they already knew ahead of time yeah, what was going actually, on. Yeah, what do you it's, think? It's, what do you think people think? Or do we even know that? Yeah, yet? it's it's actually a little confusing because there's all these reports that the, the people Iranians... are calling it a show. And the, there's also reports that Iranians are presenting this attack as actually inflicting casualties yeah, on America. Yeah, so there was 224 <laughs> casualties yeah. and like injured and casualties. Mm. And oh, that's the game we're playing So they're now? saying yeah. that they took some to Tel Aviv and... So everyone really... America's just, hiding it. Sorry, so, so Iran and the United States are both trying to present themselves as tough. Like Trump killed... Qasem Soleimani, General Qasem Soleimani, and then, you know, this is somebody that Americans, maybe not regular Americans know he was, but the media and everybody in D.C. and the Pentagon knew who Qasem yeah. He had been on mm -hmm. magazine covers before, he's been on the news before, and he basically did this as a PR win, like PR win. Like, I did what President Obama and President Bush were afraid to do. I killed the world's leading terrorists, is that mm. little sound bites they like to use. Um, and then the Iranians were like, well, we're going to retaliate too. And, and then they're both presenting it as this tough guy. I feel like, you know, I don't mean to sound crude, but I feel like it's just a pissing contest between these two governments. Yeah. You know what I mean? And everyone's kind of trapped in the middle of it. But as it happens right now, I think that... Um, Which narrative are you going with? Do you think that they, or, they were warned ahead and they were already in the bunkers? Is that the shelters, what they call it? They were in bunkers that, that moved out of the base, a lot of them already. And, right. and um, that is the dominant narrative? I think Iraqis... There's also r rumors that Iraqis were also tipped off because this was there was Iraqis at that base too, right? So either they were tipped off or not, but the Iranians... Based, the, I think the most important point to take is that they were told not to retaliate. They were threatened with not retaliating. Okay. And they retaliated anyways in a very symbolic manner. Okay. Knowingly, in my opinion, knowing that they weren't going to inflict casualties. Mm -hmm. You know, and yeah. I think that's that's very symbolically important. Like, you have to think about that. Like, in this entire conflict with the Soviet Union and the Cold War, 
We got really close to a nuclear war in the Cuban Missile Crisis, but ne they never engaged each other directly. They just fought each other th indirectly through Vietnam or Afghanistan mm -hmm. in the 80s. Mm -hmm. um, and Iran is like not the Soviet Union. It doesn't have nuclear hardware. It doesn't have any of that stuff. But it's still kind of standing up to the United States. It's still saying, however much you threaten us, you've killed our general, we're still here. Yeah, yeah. You know? yeah. And that also resonates with Iranians inside the country. Doesn't matter yeah. if they like the Iranian government or not. This is basic Iranian history. This is, this is what I work on, is that we have a 100-year history. I'm not talking about Iran and Boston, ancient Iran. I'm talking about just mm -hmm. this past 100, 100 years. It's a history <clears throat> of both domestic struggle to build a more representative government, but also a struggle against foreign powers, right? And oftentimes they were intertwined. So, for instance, the struggle in the constitutional revolution was that we have treasonous monarchs who are selling our economy to the British and Russians. And the only way we're going to extract our independence from foreign powers is by reigning in these monarchs by creating a constitution and a parliament. Mm. So these, these struggles have often been intertwined. But the one constant, even after Iran achieved its independence in 1979 with the revolution, the one constant has always been this for, these foreign powers that just covet whatever, our natural resources or mm -hmm. this whole region. You know, it's, it's a Middle East region, but the dominant power in this, in this region is not Iran or Israel or the Saudis, it's the United <clears throat> States. Yeah. The question then is why? Why is that perfectly normal? But let me connect that to the philosophy of martyrdom that's also been another thing in the past 50 years or so. Um, and to connect it back to the Soleimani thing, which some people are saying, what if the Iranian government is somehow and somewhat pleased by that assassination and how this legitimizes the regime for another 50 years to come? And it gets people to I understand to be that united. narrative. Some may think this is a stupid thing to say, but it is something that's being said. What I understand that point. I do think that killing Qasem Soleimani, there's a lot of things that um, work out in Iran's favor, uh -huh. and there's a lot of things that do not. Um, I think, for instance, the Iranian government has been trying to explain to this new generation of Iranians who are really into social media and American pop culture and music and film and styles and all that, <clears throat> that you know, American, cultures may be, American culture may be cool, but its foreign policy is very threatening to this whole region. Uh, it's very dominating. You know, very subversive to actual democratic movements. And so, um, you know, I'll try to understand this, and a lot of generations just didn't want to hear that. I think the killing of Qasem Soleimani is a crash course in that narrative now. People are like that, and that's why you saw so mm -hmm. many Iranians come out. And I know there's a tendency amongst the Iranians in the diaspora to say, oh, they were forced to come out. Not but that many. Not people. that many you people can force, can force like, to come out. They said five million, but it was at least like at three million, maybe even more. Five, Let's four, just say five, millions. Yeah. You can't force millions. millions to come out. And then if you pay attention, you'll see that there was authentic emotions mm -hmm. on display. Then these aren't these five or ten million people are not actors. You know what I mean? I'm sure some of them want to. Go, but again, it's a, it's this like national thing. Mm -hmm. And so I think that the killing of Qasem Soleimani in that regard, you know in a way kind of gives the Islamic revolution uh, a second wind, right? Okay. But I also think that in terms of military, um, you know, there's a lot of talk in the Western media that uh, killing Qasem, Qasem Soleimani weakens Iran's, you know, uh, influence in the region. That's really Iran's deterrent. It doesn't have nuclear technology, mm -hmm. nuclear weaponry. Its deterrent is really the fact that it's really influential in the Middle East through all these groups like Hezbollah and Hamas and uh, Hashtag Shabi or the Popular Mobilization Forces. But all of that really, um, it, it wasn't created by Qasem Soleimani, but Qasem Soleimani was the point man. Mm -hmm. and, and not only was he the point man, um, all these groups kind of looked up to him. He was, like the, the, he's beloved, and they yeah. looked up to him, and he was like, yeah, yeah he was a... And which is why you see demonstrations, coach, you see percent. demonstrations yeah. in Yemen. Yeah. When was the last time you saw a demonstration in Yemen in solidarity uh, well, with places Iran? Places in Africa, mm -hmm. too, right? Yeah. So, Qasem yeah. Soleimani had this super symbolic thing, and at the end of the day, he was killed in a very brutal way. So and so was, that so could also be terrifying to some Iranians. Yeah. And, and let's stick with Soleimani for now until we get everything sure. out of the way, to keep it as a segment, maybe. Yeah. Um, so you think the regime lost more of a symbol or more of a, I don't know, a general that's... So I, I was going to say this too. With him, with him dying, um, the symbol is definitely... I mean, his symbol now gets changed. He's now mm -hmm. this like Che Guevara type thing. Yeah. And Che Guevara also had enemies. So Qasem Soleimani and his legend will continue to have enemies. Mm -hmm. Che is still somebody very controversial. But he's now somebody that has... His legend has been kind of cemented. 
You know, the fact that he died at the hands of the United States, the same United States the Iranian government has been casting as the Yazid, the Yazid of our time. Right. Mm. Killed him at the age of 62 when, you know, maybe 10 years from now he'd be dead of prostate cancer or something like that. Yeah. It was probably the best way for him to go. Yeah. You know what I mean? To solidify his legend. Now, in terms of his the Iranian government's military or influence in the region, um, the Western media paints it as now this is a destructive blow to Iran's reach, right? But again, like I would say that Iran still has, uh, it's not it's not a one man show. That's the thing about yeah. the Iranian government. It's never been a one man show. It's not like he was doing everything by himself. Yeah. No one else had any knowledge these are, these of this. Organic you know? contacts that have been developed right. for decades. Right. That's yeah. the other thing people don't understand is that they always say Iran <clears> is this like, you know, tentacled. You know, has, tent shop, yeah. has tentacles throughout the region, mm -hmm. right? Whereas it's from the region and it has long-standing ties throughout communities for literally centuries, obviously, because it's been there. And so they always talk about how uh, Iran intervenes in Lebanon. Well, I'm like, there's a 500-year history between Iran and Lebanese Shiites. The fact that Iran is a, a Shiite Muslim-majority country in large part has to do with the fact that the uh, Safavid Shahs, they brought, yeah. they brought in Lebanese Lebanon. clerics because they, uh, the, uh, Shiism was a really small sect. Mm -hmm. The Safavids were Shiites, the dynasty, and they wanted Shiism to be preached to their whole country, mm -hmm. and they brought in Lebanese clerics. Yeah, and they gave Iran new life and new power, and like you know, yeah. they separated them from the other, like you know. So there's this Islam. organic history. Mm -hmm. So the Iran isn't this tentacle player. It, it has organic friends and allies, it has enemies, and so does every other country in the region, right? Yeah. The only the only true tentacle player. The player that has tentacles in that region is the country that's not from the region. Yeah, the United States. It's crazy, and like it's it's. I don't know why it's so hard. Uh, people have I don't know if it's called brainwash or whatever, but generally, I, I always wonder why don't Americans ask that questions all the time? Like, what are we doing there? We've been for so many we've years. Been it's just like, been, just, go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, you know, I'm saying they just have this belief that no, no, we have to be there. To protect the world and, you know, to be that doesn't really make sense. Like, you know, been there for hundreds of years and before that it was the British and... It, it. The point of any military is to safeguard the territorial integrity and security of your country. Yeah. Why are there m military bases around the world, right? The United States has 800 military bases. It has 60,000 troops, not just in Iraq and Syria, but across the region. Mm -hmm. We talked about this, I think, last time. There's always this, like, even now, with, when Qasem Soleimani was killed, there's all this about, well, how is Iran going to retaliate? America's actually scared. Is mm -hmm. there going to be a cyber attack? It's like, yo, at the end of the day, the United States is the one sanctioning Iran. <clears throat> at the end of the day, the United States is the one that has Iran surrounded in eastern Afghanistan, in, uh, to Iran's east in Afghanistan, to Iran's west in Iraq, to Iran's south in the Persian Gulf. At the end of the day, it's the United States that has nuclear weapons. At the end of the day, it's the United States that just killed this, Iran's top military commander. Yeah. And yet we Americans just feel so vulnerable that this country that is somewhere on the other side of the world threatens us. It's so crazy. Yeah, it's crazy. It's wild. Yeah. And also the other thing about it, they keep comparing him to, like, first of all, like, uh, for anybody who's viewing this, uh, me personally, I'm not saying my views on things, you know, because I don't really know what happened behind the behind the uh, closed doors, right? And I'm not a supporter of Iran's government. I'm not uh, against the U.S. government, anything like that in particular. It's just that we we're kind of um, what do you call it? We're checking out different ideas and different possibilities of what's happening, right? And with See, I, I, I feel like you had to give that disclaimer because anyone who kind of talks about the U.S. and Iran, if you, like what I just said, all that yeah. was true, but it's, it comes across as being supportive of the Iranian government. And it's like, yeah. look, they have to, we have to separate two things. There's Iran domestically. When it comes to domestic politics. What bothers you about people doing that? <clears throat> um, well, because, because it's much more complicated because when it comes well, to no, the, why do you think it, it, in your opinion, why do you think that's wrong? For, because if you criticize, if you, I'm just curious. No, no, I don't think it's. I don't think the disclaimer is wrong. I had to. I provide disclaimers all the time, right. but I want to make sure that people understand that uh, we have to separate the Iran domestic Iran and its domestic politics from the region. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Iran has issues domestically. We're talking about issues, we're talking about protests in November, crackdown, 1, 1,500 people died. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it, corruption, uh, sanctions, economic yeah. issues, um, all, of this, all that. All that's true. But when it comes to the region, the main issue isn't Iran, in my opinion, or the main issue around the world. We have a, we have a very 
uh, we have a government, and it's not just Trump, that thinks it could do whatever it wants around the world. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? The fact that Iran is even being sanctioned, right? You don't have to support the Iranian government to understand that these sanctions are completely that's, that's arbitrary. Yeah. Completely arbitrary. Iran was abiding by the nuclear accord. Yeah. Even when those sanctions were slapped on Iran in violation of that nuclear accord, Iran still abided by the nuclear agreement for a full year. That has nothing to do with whether we like the Iranian government or not. That is just plain unjust. And those sanctions, as much as the American government says it's directed um, at the government, any Iranian who lives in Iran or is in touch with the Iranians inside, or even just reading the articles, people are writing about yeah. it, knows that's not true. And the whole strategy of the Trump administration, it has, it's not stated. Well, they say regime change, but what does that actually mean? The strategy is to sanction Iran to the T, do a psychological psychological warfare on the country through all these media programs, Sedaev uh, America, Radio, Radio Farda, Voice of America, Radio Tomorrow, um, maybe even support separatist groups in the country, mm -hmm. Sistan Belichina, uh, yeah. Avos, and stuff like that. Sanction it so that the population could rise up. And and then, obviously, the Iranian government is going to crack crack down. Yeah. Because that's, that's what happens in, in, these whole, in this whole region. When people protest, especially when there's, when there's a Eventually, trying to overthrow your government, there's going to be people are going to get cracked, their heads cracked, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, when that happens, then those people are going to get really angry, right? And it's going to create a polarized society. Mm -hmm. But the sanctions will continue so that maybe there'll be a second round. And in the second round, there's going to be even more protests and more anger because they're still, they remember their friends and family that got killed in the last round. Yeah. And there's going to be more cracking heads. So maybe the third time this happens, when we go to give these people weapons, they'll take it. Mm -hmm. And before we know it, Iran could be in a civil war, like in Libya, like in Syria, and we could implode the country. Mm -hmm. Legit, the Trump administration's strategy, whether they say it or not, they just say regime change, is to implode Iran. Yeah. Because they don't want to invade it. Trump is the last person that wants to invade it. But they want to implode the country. Yeah, you don't want to invade it. Why, 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 why? You don't the, have to want Why do they want to invade it? Well, well, I want to know why does he think, in his opinion, that's, that's, a, that's the strategy, and why is it a good strategy for well, us? Because, it's cheaper, easier, because they can't, political... Go ahead, that's actually true, go ahead. Yeah, because it doesn't cost them the money, it doesn't cost them the political, like, discourse, oh, you went to war, like I said, you know what I mean? For the no, party. I get it, but what, what, are they, what, what are their goals? What do they want? So, let's look at the region. You have to always extrapolate Iran and place it in its region. Uh -huh. What? Look at the region. The only countries in the region that are secure, that <laughs> are, their borders are secured, there's no turmoil, are countries that are completely beholden to the United States. The Saudis, the Emiratis, Qatar, Oman, Kuwait, Jordan, you know, those countries. Those other countries that have tried to defy the United States, Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, Libya, all have been imploded. Mm -hmm. Either have been invaded or imploded. There's one country left. The last one. Last the biggest one. one the big 83 million people. And the United States was like, well, this is what happened to us in Iraq. We got stuck in it. it turned into, you know, everything just kind of exploded. We can't invade Iran. We can't attack it. Um, but if we attack it, it might turn into a shooting war, and we don't we don't really want that either. Mm -hmm. So the easiest, cheapest way, the easiest and cheapest way is to sanction it to the teeth, do psych ops, arm separatists, and get the whole country to implode. Mm -hmm. And that's actually kind of to a certain extent what's happening. That's actually happening. Yeah. The killing of Qasem Soleimani changed everything. Changed about that. that. Yeah. That's so why it's I'm confusing. Not, I'm not saying right? that. I'm not <laughs> saying that it the it's, Iran still may not implode, but. For whatever reason, because of impeachment in the United States, mm -hmm. Trump needed some sort of PR victory, <clears throat> killed Qasem Soleimani, and the the chances of imploding Iran now are still there, but a little bit less likely. Yeah, because yeah. now everyone's like, "There's a foreign enemy. Let's unite. Get the flag out. You know, this we got to like work together. This is not a time mm -hmm. to argue or protest or get and heads I think cracked. Possibly, like this is what I was saying, like when I was giving the disclaimer. That uh, at the end of it, like I, as an Iranian, I want the best for the Iranian people. So. I agree with some things and I disagree with other things. You know what I mean? So like, but this particular thing of Qasem Soleimani, you see people arguing, saying that we love him. There's like both sides of the arguments are right and wrong. Right? They're saying like, oh, but he was like during the Iran-Iraq war, he did a lot for us. Uh, he protected the country. He protected our like blah, blah, blah. And not, not blah, 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 but like a lot of important things like that. And then on the other side, they're saying at the same time, he was in charge of like doing a lot of like maybe t uh, terrorist activity and stuff like outside of Iran that uh, you don't agree with. So people hang on to whatever truth they want and they argue about it, right? They stick to the part that, oh, he, he protected Iran, and they stick to the part that, no, he did bad things outside of Iran, or, you know, whatever the case may be, and he was the right hand of the 
government, a right hand of Khamenei, things like that. And but on the media here, what I want to say about Qasem Soleimani is they portrayed him, they try this not the media, but Trump in particular, saying that he was a terrorist, they compared him to uh, al Baghdadi, leader of ISIS, and Osama bin Laden. But those guys were in like Qasem Soleimani was not in hiding, like in, in that sense, right? He he was traveling back and forth, like a lot of times he's in and out of Baghdad airport. Um, people he knew was, who he, he was. He knew was his a face. general of a sovereign country. Yeah, he's general of a sovereign Baghdad, country. Baghdad, he was nobody, yeah. and he when had Baghdad no country. He, he had land. Yeah, he had no yeah. country. Bin Laden also was a leader yeah. of the when, ba- when Baghdad he killed, and when, when Osama got killed, did you see fucking protest? Leaders from around the world, like flying to Iran for his protest, millions of people going to the street. No, because it's it's a it's, it's a different case. It was accepted by the publics of all country in general. See, there's that this, terrorists, there's, you know? this ten, there's this tendency when you have a bearded person from that a male from that region who is not aligned with our objectives in the Middle East. He has to be painted as a terrorist. Mm-hmm. The biggest gripe that the U that the United States government has with Qasem Soleimani is the fact that they accuse him, probably rightfully so, I don't know, I haven't looked at the information or evidence, but they accuse him of arming Iraqi insurgents with IEDs, improvised explosive devices, that were used on American Mm -hmm. troops, right? The number that they keep throwing out is 600 American troops died. Now, is that terrorism first, right? These are troops, you know, the the whole point, the whole issue of terrorism, the definition is when you target civilians to achieve a political objective, Right, this was a war zone, and these were soldiers. Right, not to condone it at all, but again, some. This is why being. This is why history matters. Uh, have, has, any, has anyone seen Charlie Wilson's War? Yeah, which one? Is, uh, that really silly, dumb Hollywood fic- Hollywood film based on a true story. Okay. Tom Hanks played the um, titular lead. Oh no, I didn't see it, but I know of the. Two thousand seven. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Julia Roberts was in it. Tom Hanks, and the whole movie was about how the Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan, mm-hmm. and. Um, this congressman named um, Charlie Wilson basically took the initiative to push the U.S. government to arm Afghans to kill Soviets. Mm -hmm. All right? Yeah. Now, the fundamental difference is that the Soviet Union invasion of Afghanistan happened in Afghanistan. It didn't happen in Canada. It didn't border the United States. Now... When the, in, the, in 2001, after 9-11, the United States invaded Afghanistan to Iran's east. Then they invaded Iraq to Iran's west. And then they started talking a lot about as if Syria or Iran were next. Mm-hmm. Now, they were talking about it. The data is coming out now. The, the, the stuff is getting leaked now that actually the U.S. government was really thinking about invading Iran next. Mm-hmm. And so the idea was just like we armed the Afghans, we as in the Americans, armed the Afghans against the Soviets, just like the Soviets armed the Vietnamese against us in the Vietnam War. Qasem Soleimani became the point man to arm Iraqis against the United against States the United with these explosive devices. Mm. But really not just because America was the enemy, we want to just kill Americans because we don't like them, we don't like their culture, we don't like their freedom, so crazy but because they felt, threatened, that, but yeah. they felt threatened that the United States was going to invade Iran next. Iran was encircled mm. through the South, East, and West. And of mm. course, the rhetoric coming out of DC and the data now shows that uh, the pres- the Bush administration is really thinking about invading Iran next. Mm-hmm. So this is really Qasem Soleimani's biggest crime in the eyes of the political establishment mm-hmm. and the military and the Pentagon. This is why people like Tom Cotton, um, Tom Cotton is a, 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 a veteran of that war. Uh, and this is why Pompeo, Pompeo is an army vet, not of that war because he's a bit older. These are army vets mm-hmm. who just see this guy as an enemy because he um, killed their own people, right, in Iraq. But then at the same time, Qasem Soleimani was also made in the Iran-Iraq war, a mm-hmm. war that we as, as the United States was very much involved in arming um, and funding and giving diplomatic cover to Saddam when he's us- using chemical weapons to kill mm-hmm. not just Iranians, but also Qasem Soleimani's comrades in this mm-hmm. war. Right? So it's just this really crappy, terrible issue that no one is really giving the other side this like nuance or understanding yeah and if they did they might be able to understand their enemies a little bit better and humanize one another mm-hmm. that's not happening at all yeah so also i think a lot of people in iran that might not like qasem soleimani but it's they don't like and let's say a lot of people in this country don't like trump right but if trump went to canada and someone fucking from iran or from iraq or from any country that killed him they be like, we might not like him, but it's none of your fucking business. So like, you know, like it's not, it's not just because we don't like. Because I was making a joke with my friends. I'm like, after this, this whole thing happened, 
Trump called Pompeo. He's like, you motherfucker, didn't you tell me they don't like this guy? You know, like, because I just assumed, I figured that it was an assumption that a lot of people, because of the protests in Iran, um, are going to be happy about Qasem Soleimani's death. But uh, that wasn't the case. There are a lot of people in Iran that actually, I saw a lot of interviews with people who are not, they were uh, in, in the protests, they don't like the leadership, they're not yeah. happy, and they, be- they, not. they blame everything that's going on on the leadership, and they said Qasem Soleimani was separate from that, you know? So... Yeah, yeah, I mean, to your to your uh, uh, analogy earlier, just now actually, um, it's true. Imagine if Iran did kill a revered military commander in Canada, for instance, and then said, "You have no right to retaliate. If you do, we're going to blow up the Statue of Liberty, World Trade Center, or Mount Rushmore, and we've been sanctioning you for mm-hmm. a full year, and we have nuclear weapons. You're not allowed any of mm-hmm. anything to defend yourself with, yeah. and we're going to continue to sanction you." So. It's just completely like, it's completely messed up. And you don't have to be Iranian or supported the Iranian government to figure this out. Yeah. It's basic. Yeah, that's the, like me. I'm not in support of the Iranian government. You know, so I'm, I'm quite the opposite. But uh, when you see things like this happen, I'm actually kind of annoyed. And a, lot of, a lot of people that I'm talking to, a lot of friends nowadays, were saying that the, everything, like the tide changed its path in Iran right now, you know? Because, I mean, I don't know, maybe in two months, things are going to be, people are going to be upset again. But right now, you well, just they're gonna see have a the very fort- united Middle the- East. Not that that's a bad thing. A united Middle East is good, but it depends like what direction they're united in. I don't know if we have a but, united Middle East, but yeah. we have people who um, a lot. Iran has experienced a lot of solidarity because of this. And also, yeah. when you say two months, we do know that Qasem um, Soleimani's fortieth day of mourning, Chelash, is going to be. 20, it's, on, is, that's go ahead. It's going to be around Bisudo Bahman. Yeah, yeah. It's going to be Bisudo Bahman, which yeah. is like these things makes you think of conspiracies. You know, like, like I'm like, was it really? In America's benefit to do this? Was it not? What's going on? I think I, I think the, <laughs> Trump is really excited about this. No one's even talking about the impeachment anymore. Uh, yeah. <laughs> his base is loving it because there's no war and we got to kill this guy. It's yeah. a really bad guy in our eyes. Yeah. So it, it's, I mean, I don't yeah. know if it's win-win. If, if you're um, into conspiracies, but that's the one thing though. Like his, his 40th, because I don't know, for people who don't know, uh, if you're not, um, the 40th day after you pass away in, in Iranian culture, it's a big deal. Um, and Qasem Soleimani's falls on the day of the Islamic Revolution, basically, won, you know, and they kicked out the shot. Yeah, the day you know, of the, the official yeah. day of the anniversary of it. February and 11th. so that, that's crazy. <laughs> <sighs> if Eddie Bravo was into Iran, he'd love this right now. But I will, anyways. I will also add, um, when you say that Iranians are unified, um, I mean, I, to a certain extent they are. I wouldn't say all it's, of them. Yeah. And I know, right. I know what you meant. Yeah. But that's also the issue. Anytime there's some sort of foreign aggression... Um, all that talk of, um, you know, change or dissent, all that kind of gets swept under the rug. There's mm-hmm. going to be a, an, even, an even further secure, securita- securitization of the whole, like, political sphere now. Uh, and we know this because this is basic history. When 9-11 happened, the Patriot Act was passed, yeah. limiting, civil, limiting civil liberties. Um, and every time there's been some sort of foreign intervention in Iran, it has... Uh, throwing a wrench in Iran's organic political evolution. This is mm. why, in the entire preface of my book, I talked about how um, Iranian history kind of shows that every generation is up to the task of rising up against their own governments or, or trying to improve the situation or get get accountability out of their overlords in a way. Um, but what ends up always happening is that something from abroad, um, especially the United States, um, throws a wrench in all that. The most obvious example was when Iran actually had a democratic government. Mm-hmm. Um, and the United States would, this way. And I want to talk uh, about the book definitely. I do want to finish that point though. When oh, yeah. Iran book. had a democratic government in 1953 uh-huh. at, the, at the hands of Dr. Mohammad Mossadegh, right. and the United States overthrew that government. So think about that. Let's let that sit for a second. The oldest democracy in the world that always claims to be the beacon of freedom around the world overthrew not and Iran was not the last one overthrew a democratically elected government mm-hmm. and has been doing so ever since. Yeah. For their interests. Not even like the interests of the country necessarily, but the interests like of certain people. Yeah. You know? I'm sorry, I, I sorry No, 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 no. Ahead. I'm sorry for jumping into your thing. Um <clears throat> So my question was going to be then, why does it have to be that way? Why does it have to be so black and white? Why can't there be a middle ground? Why can't there be possibilities like one where Japan and Korea and all these other countries have? Why does it have to be two extremes going at it? Yeah, so then, then the question is, why, why is the Middle East so different? Right? Because the Middle East is different. 
Right? Why, why, for instance, when the Cold War ended, when the Cold War ended, why was there so much democratization in Latin America, but not in the Middle East? Right. So a lot of people in the United States or in the West, they will say, well, what, what's unique about the region in comparison to Latin America is that there's this thing called Islam and Islam is incompatible with democracy. And so you, the Middle East has a cultural problem and they have to kind of like, you know, according to Bill Maher, Islam is the mother, no, Bill Maher's stupid guest, Sam Harris, uh, Islam is a mother load of bad ideas. Mm. Right. Um, I would say no. I'd say that um, there are things about Islam that could be used for democracy, and there are things about Islam that you could do whatever else you want with it, like 9-11. Uh, and there's a really good book about this by Asif Bayat, who's a sociologist. You would, I think, really like it since you're into sociology. Mm -hmm. It's called Making Islam Democratic, mm -hmm. right? Talking about how fluid Islam is, and it's used for anything you really want. Even, even today, and this is basically the, one of my, the main theses of my book, is that Iran is an Islamist system. So why can't we be like Turkey, then? Okay, hold on. So, <laughs> I mean, you're always comparing apples to oranges, right? But I want to say that, first of all, we can have an Islamic system, and then you can have uh, opposition that uses Islamic discourse against that same Islamic system, right? That's what's happening, in a way. But Can you repeat that again? So we have, right now in Iran, a system that legitimates itself, uh -huh. legitimizes itself through Islamic symbolism. And values, yeah. Yeah. Uh, it has, it's called the Islamic Republic. Right. It has a clerical leader. Um, it celebrates al Shura as if it's not only a cultural holiday, but it's like a political holiday. Right. Um, it has Jerusalem, sim like Jerusalem as a symbol that needs to be liberated on its currency and its, and its squares, on its streets. It's taught in schools about this Islamic city that has to be liberated. Correct. Right? That, has, that has nothing to do with Iran's borders. Gotcha. Right? That's what I mean. And then what's really interesting about 2009 was that uh, people like Ayatollah Montazeri, Ayatollah Montazeri, who was one of the architects of the system, right? He was mm -hmm. the one that helped write the constitution, right? He's the one w alongside Ayatollah Beheshti that enshrined the Velayat al in mm -hmm. the constitution. The whole idea of the rule of the jurisprudence, which is what makes Iran's system so mm -hmm. unique. Potentially next in command after Khomeini. Well, he, well, he, yeah, he was, yeah, he was next in command until uh, he objected. And that's what's really interesting about Montazeri was that um, e e even in the context of the Green Movement in 2009, they hailed them as their spiritual leader. Mm -hmm. And someone like Montazeri, who was part of the system in the 80s, helped create it, was one of his architects, one of the framers, if you will, uh, ended up using Islamic discourse to oppose the Islamic system that he founded mm -hmm. by saying that the Iranian government is neither Islamic nor republic, nor a republic. And that... Um, if we want to save Islam, we have to save it from, a, from the government, mm -hmm. right? And so th you see this also in the Green Movement. Not to say the Green Movement was an Islamic movement. I'm not saying that at all. The Green Movement kind of created the space where everybody who had an issue was able to kind of come underneath its canopy of protest. Um, but the symbols that they used, or the symbols that they subverted, were all Islamic symbols. Like, they, they came and said on Jerusalem Day of all days, a day that the Iranian government founded right after the revolution, and they came and said, <laughs> I think we mentioned this last time, na na so I guess, but what, they also said, it, you know, But in a way, so, so what are you saying? You're saying it's impossible for, the, for, for any relationship to exist? No. What, no, no. So, so what, what, what ways are there? What, what do you think? How do you see any possibilities from, from, from happening where there could be some sort of a tie and the sanctions don't break people's backs and, and how things may not get worse? What okay, is it? so these are this how much different this topic. has to do with people in power wanting to hold their power by any means necessary. Like, I want to know where do we line, where do we draw the line, and I want to also bring some awareness to the nature of the conversation thus far, almost sounding in one direction. I want to be able to bring some balance, not sure. because of sides, but because of different point of views and sure. for different people to be able to get answers. Okay, um, just to, just to quickly wrap up what I was saying, I was just trying to say that, and I'm um, sorry, no, I no, cut no. you off. Yeah, but yeah, the nature of show is for of that course. to happen. The idea is that um, Islam can be used for government and it could be used for democracy. It could be anything you want it to be. And that's the whole point of Bayat's book and what I did with mine. Mm -hmm. um, now, what you, your question is, like, where do we go from here? Yeah. Or how can we make this work? Or how can we have a government that probably has better relationships with the international community, therefore, and thus less sanctions? And well, the, so J on. the Iran nuclear agreement was exactly designed for that. Uh -huh. It was because the main sticking point with Iran and the West was this nuclear program. There's other sticking points, but that's a big one, right? 
That's a big global issue is nuclear weapons, right? Um, and nuclear weapons are not a problem unique to Iran. You know, there's a lot of countries that have them, and those are also problems, right? But they're mm -hmm. trying to stop proliferation. Countries that have it don't want others to have it, basically. Right. The whole point of the JCPOA, the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, uh -huh. nuclear agreement, was to um, basically lift Iran's sanctions, lift the sanctions against Iran um, in return for guarantees that were enforceable and monitored and verifiable that Iran was not building uh, anything close to a nuclear weapons. Now... That was supposed to be a starting point. From there, uh, there's going to be an op there was supposed to be an opening between Iran and not the world, because the United States or Western Europe are not the world. Iran has good relations with a lot of other countries, mm. right? But the idea was that it was supposed to be an opportunity to then build on other issues or build a trust so that we could attack, address other issues, right? That, all, that stuff all takes time, right? None of that was given a chance. Trump ran his whole campaign on Islam hates us, Mexicans are bad, close borders, ban Muslims, um, take back the country. I don't know what that means. From Make who? America great again as if it was in the slums um, and subvert the Iran nuclear agreement. Those are all his campaign problems. I'm probably missing a couple. It was a, little, a few years ago, but those are some of the key ones I remember. Mm. First thing he did well, was fly out to Saudi Arabia. Right? Even though on the whole campaign trail, he said the Saudi Arabia was behind 9-11. First thing he did when he became president, he flew out to Saudi Arabia, signed a $110 billion arms agreement. Mm -hmm. Those arms come with strings. Those, that agreement came with strings. Mm -hmm. Saudis are like, we want to help your economy. We're going to sign a $110 billion arms agreement with you. So we hope this relationship not blossoms into something else. And one of the things we'd really like you to do is to sanction Iran. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And so when you say, where did we go from here? I think we have to understand where we were. And if it's not too late... We need to go back to the nuclear agreement because that was the world's most important and successful uh, arms control agreement, period. It just was. It was, a, it was something that human beings hadn't done before, right? Mm -hmm. And so if we want to talk about anything, that has to be addressed. Where we go from here means that the United States has to go back to the agreement and Iran has to reverse whatever it has done. Um, in terms of uh, starting to um, enrich uranium again. Mm. Cause for it seems the like the past few days was actually, again, a big blow to that, too. They yeah. kind of said, like, we're done. Yeah, cause and effect, though, mm. right? So it's so, in it's so interesting that the uh, conversation in the United States, like, I saw a lot of Trump supporters say <clears> that um, Iran agreeing to start enriching its an agreement goes to show how naive Obama was to trust Iran um, to sign this agreement and to uphold this end of the bargain. I'm like, are you guys serious? Do you guys have like amnesia? <laughs> this agreement was working for a full, for, until Trump came into office. And even when he subverted for a full year, it still held. It's just that, you know, That's you can't of... accept the Iranians to wrap up their nuclear program and to accept your sanctions. Well, the counter yeah. to that was because they were using that freedom, financial freedom, to fund a lot of groups. So those groups existed before the Iran nuclear agreement. Right. And, um, they were, they were they're just there. These are Iran's allies. Whether you like them or not is a different issue. But those groups all existed. And really what Iran was doing, its real outside of its borders fighting was ISIS. Right? So Iran was leading the charge because the Iraqi military collapsed mm -hmm. in the face of ISIS when it marched on Mosul. So if you guys remember in summer 2014, uh, it had took over Fallujah. No one really kind of, it was kind of quiet. And then it, and it first of all, it was in Syria, in Raqqa. It was in Syria, northeast Syria. And then it took over Fallujah. Still wasn't really kind of getting a lot of attention. And then it took over Iraq's second largest city, really without a fight. Mm -hmm. 1,000 ISIS fighters just marched on um, a city that was defended by 30,000 soldiers. That crazy momentum at that time. Crazy it momentum. Was, yeah. And it didn't begin, it didn't end up, because when they took Mosul, that momentum amplified. Because mm -hmm. then they took over banks that had, U.S. Cash, dollars in it. Yeah. They took over bases that had American tanks. And those tanks were then spread out across uh, everywhere that it was taking over. And then from most, from most, it came down and took um, Tukrit, Iraq, uh, Saddam Hussein's birthplace, which is a you know, hotbed of like, Sunni like anger. And then it was moving on to Baghdad. Mm -hmm. And then uh, Sistani, Ayatollah Sistani, Iraq's most important religious leader, issued a fatwa saying, this is an emergency. Every able-bodied Iraqi needs to take up arms and defend the city, right? But there mm -hmm. needs to be know-how. 
That's when Qasem Soleimani came in and organized them into militias. Because the Iraqi army kind of faded, melted away. When 1,000 ISIS fighters marched on um, Mosul, 30,000 Iraqi soldiers were just like, we're leaving. Because these people are nuts. They're burning yeah. people alive. They're beheading people. And I spent times that people were joining them. Girls were going over there from all like, from Europe and yeah. even some from America. Remember, like people yeah. were just going there becoming brides and it was just crazy. And yeah. So when they that's say gone that, now. Why? So when they say that Iran um, was free to kind of do whatever it wanted in the region, well, first of all, Iran belongs in that region. It's very active, and everyone's kind of active in that region, including the United States, obviously, right? But a lot of what Iran was doing from 2014 onwards was fighting ISIS. Uh, it was also, you know, f- uh, helping the Syrian government from collapsing in the way of l- a largely Sunni jihadi insurrection that was happening that was backed by the Saudis. Right? But all this nuance is kind of like swept under the rug when they talk about this. There's always these things that are kind of recycled in the Western media that they say it so many times it becomes true. Like the, the United States flew, uh, oh, President Obama flew in um, a jumbo jet of worth $150 billion to Iran yeah. to kind of like whet Iran's appetite to sign this agreement, which is just like. So on. let me simplify this for, because I'm not, I don't know, I'm not too knowledgeable in this area, in this field. What you're essentially saying is, like, basically, Iran has every right to act like a superpower just like any other country and to be able to fund whatever group it pleases just like any other superpower. And therefore, they had the right to do what they did. Well, I'm not talking about rights. I'm talking about context, right? The United, the United States wants to send weapons all across the region. It wants to build bases all across the region. And then it wants no one to do anything akin to what it's doing, uh-huh. right? Um, and I think that it wasn't about rights, <clears throat> Uh, the Iraqi government, we have, these are sovereign countries. Whether you like Bashar al-Assad or not, it's the sovereign government of Iraq. A lot of, uh, I'm sorry, Bashar al-Assad is a sovereign government, heads the sovereign government of Syria. Now, you might have a legitimacy issue. A lot of Syrians died in the war or dying right now. A lot of Syrians don't accept it. But it's still the government, whether we like it or not. And that government asked its wartime ally from the Iran-Iraq war to come and help it. Right, remember that. Iran didn't just intervene as this like person that's just invading countries, right? When the Iran Iran when the Iran Iraq war happened, every government sided with Iraq. Mm-hmm. I'm not talking about every Arab government. I'm talking about every government. Western Europe, the Soviet mm-hmm. Union, the United States, and the Arab governments. Mm-hmm. One didn't, and that was Syria. And that helped Iran kind of sandwich Iraq because Iran is to Iraq's east. Syria is to Iraq's west. There's an Iraqi pipeline that goes through Syria to the Mediterranean. S- by siding with Iran, Syria shut down that pipeline. So we're not going to let you trans- we're not going to let you sell your oil, mm. and therefore you're not going to have money to bankroll your war with Iran. Of course, they did still because everyone gave it money, but it made it harder, mm. right? So these are wartime allies. So the Iranian government's like, if the Syrian government falls, we don't have very many allies in this region, especially state allies, allies that are heads of state, right? If it falls. It's akin to us falling in Tehran. So we, and they want our help. They've asked us to help. We're not invading their country. So they mm-hmm. went. Right? When Qasem, Soleimani went, when Qasem Soleimani went into Baghdad to shore up the resistance to ISIS, it wasn't an invasion. It wasn't a right to defend. It was, it, these Iraqis invited him in and they, they credit him. Even to this day, this is why his funeral procession did not begin in Iran. Think about that. Mm-hmm. Iran and Iraq were at war for eight years. Hassan Soleimani is an Iranian, but his funeral procession did not begin in Iran. It began in Iraq, and it went to Qazimain, Najaf, and Kabbalah. These are Iraq's most holiest shrine cities. Mm-hmm. And then they went to Ahwaz, Kerman, Mashhad, Tehran, and then back to uh, Kerman again. So this is just really fascinating about all this. Well, and do you our think that would have his- continued if we wouldn't fund a lot of the stuff over there? But you think it's necessary for that to I happen? I think all these things that have happened are products of U.S. interventions. Or, or not even U.S. interventions, just wars, uh-huh. right? So there wasn't, there wasn't any Hezbollah until Israel invaded Lebanon. Uh-huh. There wasn't any ISIS or Al-Qaeda in Iraq until the um, invasion of Iraq. Uh-huh. There wasn't no Ak- bin Laden until the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, okay. right? So, you know, we have to understand that this is why history really matters. There's a causal relationship to all this. Mm-hmm. They don't just come out. People don't just read the Quran and be like, "I want to kill Americans." You know what I mean? That Quran has existed for a long time. Right. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. It's that people become these wars change you. 
mm-hmm. and then you express your rage in your own cultural discourse. Like right now, there was a war in the United States and it traumatized Americans, friends and family would be dying. They would be expressing that rage in Christian discourse. <clears throat> you know, this is the whole, this is Christian land. Like I'm a Christian, like Jesus is with me. We got to fight. This is the apocalypse. Mm-hmm. This is the Armageddon. Did you tell you, that doesn't mean Christianity is violent. Gotcha. No. Gotcha. Like it's tough to talk about these things without, um, uh, because there's so much that actually happens that we don't know about, right. you know? So it's like hard to have, uh, at least for me, I could talk about myself, hard to have like a definite point of view on things as far as like what happened. But um, I think it's just very strange that like, what happened in the past week is just very strange to me. A lot of it doesn't make sense. It's scary too. Um, yeah, yeah, it's scary. Um, I'm Talk about that fear though, maybe too, because people... Would like to hear how you reacted to it, how you felt it in your bones, and how you experienced it. Yeah, I mean, yeah. When it, the first thing happened, actually, my my my, my uh, mother was visiting me. She was at my house. Can't be seeing me after God God knows how long. Mm-hmm. And uh, got the first news, and you know, I have a few uh, there's, there's some comes in news channels on Telegram that keep updating, and I, then I checked like CNN, BBC from here, and like I had my TV on. And my my friends were making fun of it. It was like a newsroom at my house, and I was updating everybody on what's happening. Mm-hmm. And at some point, it just got really emotional because I'm like, okay, like, based on what Trump's been saying the past few days and what just happened, they attacked an American base. And at that time, I thought there's 4,000 Americans there. At that time, they said, like, there's 4,000 Americans that are supposed to be there, the biggest um, American base in Iraq. That's the place that Trump goes to, blah, blah, blah. So I thought, like, holy shit. Like, uh, I thought, wow, a lot of Americans died maybe. Yeah. And now Trump's definitely going to retaliate. Yeah. So I thought, and then we heard reports of, the jets flying from uh, Emirati, uh, American jets lift, lifting from Emirati, like uh, bases in, in the UAE. But then they said it was in Turkey, and yeah. then we heard the Amer- American jets lifting. So it was just escalating very quickly. And I'm like, holy shit, like for sure something's gonna happen in, in Iran, and they're gonna hit something in Iran. Then, as uh, naturally, if everything were, were true the way we were hearing at that time, it would have happened. Um, but at that, I mean. And that's where I heard it from too. I heard it yeah. from you through that text message, and then I go. And it hit me in a way I never thought it was going to hit me. Like, mm-hmm. it hit me on so many different levels. Like, yeah. I literally felt sick to my stomach and I was about to puke. Yeah. And things just start flashing, you know. And, and I thought about my dad. And he lives here. But I was like, I felt like, is he going to be okay? Yeah. You know, and it's heavy. And it kind of, it's a humbling moment because it gets you to see what a lot of people in those other countries have gone through wars in the recent years have been feeling like, you know, Iraqi people and so on. Yeah, yeah. Shit, and psychologically, what kind of damage is this doing Mm -hmm. to our, you know, to to, to people generally? Yeah. Like, can you... (laughs) Go ahead, sorry. Like, I mean, can you speak on that a bit? Like, the psychological warfare and the psychological trauma and how do you spend time into that aspect of this? We experience it. We, every Uh, one of us, who cares about Americans and Iranians, we experience this on a daily basis. Yeah. Yeah. I will say this. It's also really important to understand that um, whenever there is an American war, Uh the the primary casualties of that war are residents of that battlefield, wherever that battlefield is. It's always a country. There's no actual battlefield, right? Um, So... The war actually affects Americans last. It's not, mm-hmm. you know, it, if you, some Americans do experience it, obviously. The families of the soldiers, the soldiers themselves, obviously. But those bombs are not exploded in the United States. Right, it's not a they're, Pearl Harbor yeah, type they're of Yeah, yeah. these wars are always fought in other people's countries, from Vietnam to Iraq and maybe n- now in Iran or Gaza or wherever mm-hmm. else, right? So... Um, you know, Americans have always this anxiety, mainly mainly because the United States is always in a conflict, right? But for us who live here and we have a connection to that region, it's a different kind of anxiety. Mm-hmm. Because for us, it's not just something you watch on news. It's not entertainment. It's something that we have to worry about because we're worried about what's going to happen to so friends and family or yeah. just people we care about. We, you know, like these are human beings and we, identi- we, we recognize their humanity more than, say, others might yeah. because we know them. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's what I was, when I was thinking about the war, it's like, the things are already messed up over there, economy's already messed up, uh, there's like, you know, the, plenty of things that are going on already, so the least that can happen, least outcome of a war with Iran is that for those things to get even worse, you know what I mean? Yeah. And uh, that's the least that could happen, so I immediately started thinking about people that I know there, uh, you know, economy getting worse, and 
for me, because of the music side, it's not just that people that I know. Like, I'm in touch with uh, a lot of people yeah. from different cities in Iran. Like, fans message me. Whatever happens, they right. immediately write You're to me about connected. it. You know what I mean? So I'm connected yeah. to people from some small villages, different belief types, oh, people yeah. who strongly support the government, people who hate the government, yeah. people like all kinds of them. And, like, they're all, like... I see all of them gonna like have it's gonna be worse for all of them, you know. No matter who you are in Iran, it's right. not gonna be better for you. You know, there what are I mean? no so, there are no winners in war. Yeah, Plain exactly. That's what when you see shit like blow those fuckers like people they just don't get it. Like you see stuff on like Twitter or whatever, they just like blow them up. Let's like get them or like they say like these, are, these, are, these are, are Americans or Iranians? No, I'm talking about Americans. Um, Americans. The Iranians even like that sickens me. That is even the, even worse. Like it's Iranians for who lobby for war in Iran, mm -hmm. just so. They're political, like so they could get power in Iran one day. Yeah, they That's have all. they have like, so much hate for the Iranian government that they're willing to sacrifice the safety and well being of an entire people for their own political acts to grind. Yeah. And that's, that's a it. terrible thing. Yeah. It's a terrible let me do you, did you follow I feel like it's a form of hypnosis of some sort. You know, to me now, um, I have no moral judgment towards people that eat meat, but however it's shifted for me, and that's how I perceive people now, or my own self that used to eat meat. I'm like, oh, people are just hypnotized to thinking this is okay. Mm -hmm. No judgment on people that do, mm -hmm. because I was there. But that's how I perceive it, you know? And I and I get it. It's like people are just walking as if it's like a fucking Atari game. Atari, dating myself here, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what is a PS2, bro? <laughs> but it's it's unreal how... Snakes and ladders. What's the word? I'm desensitized they are to the possibility of human life. That's what I'm saying. It's because like when it's from far away... You, you don't think of it like that, yeah. you know. It's like they, 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 just like oh, this a bomb blew up and Iran lost. Yeah. You don't think about how many people' lives are ruined, lost, like injured. I uh, had, uh, holidays, right? We always have family and friends come over, and you have these conversations, and you hear something that's kind of nuts. Yeah. I want to tell you guys what one of my I'm not gonna tell you which family member, but one <laughs> said it from he, he was they were visiting, mm. and he is a hardcore monarchist. Okay, okay, okay. Hardcore. Okay. A, a lot of my family are, yeah. right? I'm not, but a lot of my family are. Yeah. Which is crazy, by the way. <laughs> well, I have a lot of... I mean, every Iranian family has a lot of different strands, I feel, right? Mm. My, 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 I think it's a generational thing, too. I think we just, like, see things differently. But yeah, Did you do that but... to form your own identity? I'm kidding. No, Go no, on. I guess. Okay. good question. <laughs> uh, Go ahead. Gonna say, what do you say, though? And so he's a, he's a hardcore monarchist, uh -huh. yeah. right? Like, Reza Pahlavi is great. <laughs> even though he hasn't, <laughs> he has, he has, even though he hasn't done anything, uh, right? But yeah. yeah. And his whole idea, and the monarchists and the MEK are just have nothing in common except for the hatred of the Iranian government, right? MEK? Mojahedin. Depends who says it. Yeah, I said that one time. This guy was like, Yanichi. I don't know, man. I don't know anything. I know nothing. That's how you were raised You were raised in Iran for for a while or no? I lived in Iran for eight years. Yeah, there you go. So that's where it came from. And I have to explain that. So he basically said... He was in jail for so long. He was like having tears in his eyes. I'm like, I don't know, man. So my family member said that the Mujahideen, this is an armed organization, mm -hmm. should arm these protesters in Iran when the next time happens. That was his idea. Yeah. Mm. And so things could, fighting could happen. Right. And eventually, I think, if a, he should have said, enough blood is shed so that the Iranian government just quits. And I was like, well, while you you're fucking like, sitting so here. It's so easy. It's so, yeah, exactly. Eating same. a turkey. Yeah, it's so easy for people outside of the country to make these claims. And I told him, I'm like, I'm like, just because the Shah fled after a lot of people died, just because he left, it doesn't mean they're going to leave like in mm -hmm. such circumstances. Case in point, Bashar al-Assad stayed in Syria and fought. The whole country was turned to rubble, mm -hmm. and he and he persisted. And this government, whether we like it or not, has far more support than Bashar al-Assad does. Hundred percent. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not saying as majority support. But it has far more support and far more zealous support. Yeah. They're not going to leave, even if the country gets turned to, sh uh, even if the country gets. They have to nowhere to go. That's a, that's, that's what people don't point. get it. Like you know, like the Iranian, like that's why they they're so hardcore about it. It's because like they really they can't they don't have anywhere to go. You know, you have to like hold on to it as much as you can. Yeah. And the thing you said about the family member, one of my friends, I, I just posted a video of that. It wasn't even I wasn't even there. My cousin saw protests in downtown LA, anti-war protests, anti-Iran war. And I put it on my story, and one of my good friends messaged me. She's like, um, so what's the other option? Yeah, I've heard that. 
Dude, I was just getting fucking ready to write them like, fuck it, like, why am I arguing with her about it? I just put my phone down. I'm like, people don't get it that, like, the effects of war last generations and it's, yeah. a, it's a long time and it's a lot of shit. What do you mean? Like, what's the other option? You know, just like, fuck there it. Is, like, that is not even an option. Yeah. That's just not an option. I don't <laughs> yeah. care if you can't, if you can't figure out another option, that doesn't mean that's the only one. That's so not one an option. So one of the options that, that's playing out is, uh, are the sanctions, right? In your view, how are these sanctions playing out? Do you think it's it's going to be fruitful for opposing? I don't know. I'm, go ahead. I was going to say look at North Korea, but go ahead. I'm just wondering, like, do you think that's there's a point to this sanction? What is it doing? To I think the sanctions are designed to implode the country. Okay. Yeah, because we know that Pompeo gave a list saying. So you're saying it's effective. I think the goal is that I, I think that it's possible. Uh, like I said, the Qasem Soleimani killing kind of makes it a little bit harder to implode the country because people kind of like coming together a little bit. But I think that um, the idea is that Pompeo has voiced what he wants from Iran for those sanctions to be removed. And essentially, it's a total surrender. Right? We want Iran to stop its missile development program. Essentially saying, you have to, remain, you have to trust us to not invade your country and we want you to, to stop preparing for your own defense, mm. right? So we can have every weapon we want. We could encircle you, but we don't want you having missiles. Uh, we don't want you to have any nuclear technology, none. As Trump is showing off that I did this with the military, yeah. rebuilt America's Navy, rebuilt yeah. like this, you got, yeah. Yeah, so we want you to have no nuclear technology, even though lawfully under the, non, uh, uh, under the Nuclear Proliferation Treaty, Iran is entitled to nuclear technology. It's not nuclear weapons. Pompeo says it's part of his like 12 point program. No missiles, no nuclear tech, period. Also, we want you to stop supporting all these groups in the region while we continue to flood the region with arms and have bases everywhere. So mm -hmm. basically they, what they're asking for is let us dictate your foreign policy. Mm -hmm. And that's the one constant in the 100 years history of the last 100 years of history, of Iranian history, is Iran has to be independent. And that independent can't just be a slogan. Independence means being able to prepare your own defense, being, having the means of defending yourself, being able to dictate your own foreign policy. Because in the early 20th century, the British were dictating Iran's foreign policy. Yeah. I got you. Well, so, so basically you're saying that the only way is to put up with whatever gets thrown at, at Iran until they have a solid defense system. I think, I, yeah, I don't, I don't really know. I don't really know what's going to happen. I don't know the solution. I think that How they, close are they to... to nuclear technology and weapon and what are they saying? they're not close to weapons at all and we know this because they, they're still being monitored by um the international uh, atomic energy agency iaea mm. uh -huh. so they're still being monitored so why do you think one question on the yeah. sanctions while we're at it is that um i'm curious as to why we as people aren't doing a better job especially the ones overseas doing something about talking against the sanctions but reacting so strongly to the protests and wanting to send internet when that start that shit starts happening, yeah. meaning that in a way it's the sanctions that led to people to come on the streets to in get part, killed yeah. in the first place. So it puts me in a very confused place about if you're so passionate about spreading awareness in that way, why? And I don't want to say you, we. Why aren't we more? Um, I don't know, proactive in that regard. Why can't we? S we, we do something about this. It depends on who you talk to, right? right. So there are Iranians who... Um, so human rights. Something that sounds really good. We Does that question make sense? It makes perfect sense. Yeah. Human rights is something that... It's two words. Everyone thinks it's important. We all agree. Sounds, also sounds really good. Human rights. Then you see that human rights is something that is politicized. So we, we attack a country for having human rights violations while we commit our own human rights. Or we attack one country for human rights violation while we enable another country to commit human rights yeah, violations. So when Rex Tillerson, when Rex Tillerson, who is an um, oil executive, uh -huh. who became Trump's first Secretary of State, he's an oil executive. A Secretary of State is supposed to be America's top diplomat. He had no <laughs> diplomatic training. So they were training him. And the documents were leaked that actually said, legit said, human rights something we talk about when it comes to our enemies, Iran and China, and we give our allies, Saudi Arabia Emirates, a free pass. Yeah, sure. And you see that Fuck when it comes want. to the sanctions too. There are those who support sanctions, Iranians and Americans supporting sanctions on Iran, 
And then when the protests happen and heads are cracked at the hands of the Iranian government, they're like, human rights. Homies, the sanctions on Iran are one big <coughs> human rights violation, period. People are dying because of those sanctions. So let's be consistent about it. And there's also a causal relationship, as Erfan said. Those sanctions are in part responsible for the economic situation that led to those protests. Mm -hmm. I was saying that there's like the issue, the confusing parts is like, I don't know, for me personally, right? You get, you get like, you get put in these categories. As soon as you say something like that, oh, you were the Iranian government, you say something else like, Oh, you're anti-American. You just like I just like it's very difficult sometimes to like kind of like choose what you talk about. Right. It's different. Even in this, in it, 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 yeah, yeah, it's it's very difficult. Even I was thinking like right now, especially because um, like Puya talks about this stuff all day, right? He teaches in, in, at MIT. This is his like his field. But for me, sometimes, and it's a very emotional thing from emotional subject for me, uh, and, and I might get excited and use the wrong verbiage or like portray myself or my views in a way that it's not what I'm trying to say. You know what I mean? So it's just like very scary like to do it. But um, that's all. I just so, want to say yeah, that. Yeah, so that's an important point. On my last day of all my class, um, all the semesters that I teach, the last day, I go through this whole spiel with them. We don't actually talk about history or the Middle East or anything like that. We go through this whole <coughs> spiel about the responsibility I expect from my students as it relates to the knowledge they've acquired in this class. And really what I want from them is to remain critical going forward. Because they're not going to remember the facts that we go through or the histories. But they're learning um, analytical skills. Mm -hmm. And I want them to remember that. And one thing I always tell them, it's really important to be critical. Criticizing government does not mean you hate your flag or your constitution or your upbringing yeah. or your city or your country. No. But people have it in their heads. And this is government also. Like Every government's dream is to think that Love of country means love of government. Mm -hmm. Not true, right? Yeah. So it's important to be critical. My book coming out is on the uprising in Iran in 2009, the Green Uprising in 2009. It's called, the, it's called Contesting the Iranian Revolution, the Green Uprisings. It's a 350-page critique of the Iranian government. That does not mean I hate Iran. That does not mean I hate the people. That does not mean I want war with the country. And I had to preface all that too, that in no way do I want my book to be used to justify hawkish policies on Iran or sanctions or any war or Can anything like that. Can you give me an outline of some of these criticisms? Very short. Like, what are they? So, List it. the long story short is that... Um, you got to be careful when people say that because they usually make it very long. I'm trying to say that... Um, the Iranian government has these certain symbols that it uses for legitimizing itself. Okay. Now, everyone looks at the Green Uprising in 2009 as a failure because its stated goals of either abrogating Ahmadinejad's second election win failed and or uh, overthrowing the system that legitimated his second election win or ratified his election win also failed. My argument in the book is that the government still has a lot of sources of legitimacy. And the Green Movement succeeded. It may have failed in those two objectives that I just stated, but it succeeded in robbing the Iranian government of mm. all of its sources of legitimation. And that's why I think, I, I haven't read every book on Iran, but I've read many of the books <coughs> written by academics on Iran. And this is a sensitive history that is one of the most subversive books written on Iran. By that's an academic. interesting point. So that's, you're basically criticizing the Iranian government for Iran, not for... I'm documenting right. how the uprising... Right, I'm right. a historian, right? right? So I'm documenting how the uprising... Right. Succeed, point of view. ...succeeded uh -huh. in robbing the government of all of its sources of legitimation. Right. right? It, and so again, mm -hmm. I'm not, I don't hate Iran when I no. do this. No, but and it when sounds I like you're actually saying how can Iranian government function better. No, I'm I'm, t I'm trying to tell you that it's a shell of a for its former self, mm. and I kind of at, the, at well, my the thing, at my no? conclusion at my conclusion. I'm, no, I'm actually trying to say that you have to read it. It's actually a long story. I know, I know, but I, I mean, I think it's it's you're saying how can the Iranian government become a better government? So that's what I took from it. Am I out of my mind? No, that's not what I'm saying. Okay, you could take from that what you want. You have to read the book. So I'm making that meaning. Like, you, when you read the book, you'll understand. Okay. Right? Uh, and also, it's not what I'm saying, okay. right? Because um, when, I, um, when I meet people and they find out this is what I do, especially if they're Iranians from Iran, they get a little bit 
defensive. Like, who is this American? Because they see me as an American because I grew right, up here. Right, right. They're like, who's this American writing about this history that I was personally involved with? Uh-huh. Right? So I just want, what I would like them to know okay. is that every single source that I cited in this book uh-huh. are Iranian, Farsi language, Iran-based sources. So That's this not is, easy to this do. Is, this, for me, it's hard because wow. I'm a yeah. native English speaker. I right. speak Persian. I can read and write it, but not nearly as quickly as I could read and write English. So this is their story. I analyzed it, I put it together, but it's their history, their story, as they told it, as oh. they documented, as they demonstrated it. What, what else does it criticize? I'd love to know more. Uh, criticizes the Iranian government. It, it uh, shows how all of its sources of legitimation were subverted. Uh, it criticizes a lot of governments in the region. It criticizes the U.S. military presence in the region, but it's really about Iran. Mm. And why do you think it would be important, especially and particularly for Iran and Americans, to get their hands on that book? Well, I think for one, I, it would show that look, I'm not. We had this conversation last night. I'm I'm not religious. I do come from a Muslim background. I come from a deeply felt Muslim background, but mm-hmm. I'm not religious. I don't fast. I don't pray. I don't do any of that. Right. But it also it's important for Iranians to understand because there's a whole generation of Iranians that were either raised by the under the authority of the Iranian government, Correct. or they were raised here and Islam is completely foreign to them. And so they have this very tainted view, especially if they were raised in Iran, that this very like per- subjective experience of Islam as it was shoved down their throat by the Iranian government. So w- what I do is I show that, again, Islam is not only a religion that is meant to be sad- uh, harnessed by a state for you know, government, but it can be a discourse of resistance to even an Islamic state like mm-hmm. Iran. So no. it shows you that Islam can- is, is multifaceted. It's not just a government. Because for a whole generation, to them, it's just government. Mm-hmm. Islam is just government. Mm-hmm. Not the case. Yeah, exactly. And They're ultimately, you're hoping the takeaway is going to be... Um, like well, at the end, what are you hoping people are going to walk away? I'll tell you the truth. I yeah, actually, like, truth. I actually, and I put, put it in the preface, for one. I'm kidding. For <laughs> one. <laughs> I actually wrote in my preface that there was... I had a real concern about not even publishing this, right? So mm. if this was a PhD dissertation. Uh, it was going to, you know, if it doesn't get published, if no one wants to publish it, then it could be confined to the catalog, the dissertation catalog at the University of Michigan, and no one could ever read it. Done. Mm. Um, and then uh, Cambridge wanted to read it, uh, Cambridge University Press. Um, the dissertation won an award. They were at the award. They asked to read it. They read it. They really liked it. Went through the whole publishing process. But I had doubts throughout most of the time. I'm like, should I publish this? Right. Because I know it's going to, people are going to use it to legitimize very right-wing policies mm-hmm. against Iran. And I don't want that. So, I, you know, my, my solution, I had two reasons why I ended up doing it. One was because I really identified with those people in that protest movement and what happened to them. Mm. Right, we all do. I remember you guys made songs about it. You guys um, yeah. did a lot of stuff online too. Uh, it was a very pivotal moment in all of our lives. And so I'm like, no, I feel I feel obligated to tell this story as best as I can. So then there was all this pressure to do it right, right? Like there's an enormous pressure to tell a history that people still feel. Like I'm not writing about a hundred years ago. No. If I have hundred, I have no responsibility to nobody but my own scholarship. But I'm telling something. I'm telling a story that happened in 2009, and so people are still around, obviously. Yeah. Um, so I felt a huge burden to do it right, which is why I graduated in 2015. But the book, I finished the dissertation in 2015, but it's not coming out as a book until this February 2020. I went through the whole process of making sure that everything is right. So it's nice. much longer looking, than it was. Looking forward dissert- to reading it. it I hope. So. Yeah. I hope. Yeah. I hope. I hope. I did the history right. Mm. And then my other solution was to write a whole preface about what my intentions are with this book, Mm -hmm. right? And and basically just summarizing what I just told you guys. Like I I felt a connection and an obligation to those people, those historical agents on the ground in 2009, um, but also don't want this to be used by pro-war, pro-sanctions people at all. Cherry pick the things that they want and, and use it against, yeah. And I mean, I don't, it's a preface. I don't even know if anyone's going to read it. Yeah. So when I go to, because you know, I expect to do book talks, I'm just going to read the preface on my book talks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, I did a podcast was e- with East as a podcast. And mm. the entire, like we have one podcast where it's just me reading the preface. Yeah. 
<laughs> well, it's, you know, knowledge is like it, scholarship and knowledge and all that stuff. It's, it's yeah. it, do you have responsibilities to it? And it's worrying how people use it. Thank you for explaining as elaborately as you did. Erf, I, I have a final question. Do I have time or not? Uh, we're kind of short on time, but if it's an important question, you should always ask it. I mean, it's a question that I really wanted to ask and probably the most important question I wanted to ask. Um, ask. Not the most important, but I've been very curious by it. And I told you how, um, how much I enjoy reading your tweets on Instagram. Um, and one of my fears is that if, uh, for the day that you stop posting your tweets on Instagram, because I don't have Twitter. Twitter? Just, just so the listeners know, the I'm tweets not. are on Twitter. Right. I occasionally post, or daily actually. Occasionally? No. So you... <laughs> no, no, I, I, I post one of my tweets uh, as an Insta story. Okay, yeah. right. Good, good, good. So um, they're definitely very insightful. They have their own wonderful touch. However, I'm very curious as to why they're always... One side. One side and how? Tom. It, it just sounds biased. And nothing wrong with that. But it just, why does one, and you, I've brought that up to you before, you and did. I feel like you're going to answer me, and I'm still not going to get my answer, but I'm still going to ask. Yeah. And everyone's not giving me enough time to get you to that point of getting the final answer. Um, We're out of time. <laughs> you guys work together? I'm gonna dodge that We're out of time. <laughs> <laughs> okay, What's everybody, no, I'm kidding. It's been a good show. Um, Imagine you're pl yeah, unplugging. <laughs> why do you, this is giving you enough time to think? Um, why do you do that? You're gonna tell me you're not doing it, but you are. No, no, no. I'm so. Why? What's the point of you just giving one side of the narrative and not having a more of a balanced narrative? All right. So, just so the viewers or listeners know, the, that one side is me being extremely critical of the U.S. government. Yeah. Yes. All right. Never defending the Iranian government, but extremely critical of the U.S. government for a number of reasons. One is that there's a huge power dynamic between Iran and the United States, right? And if you are an Iranian in the United States, adding to all the hate that Iran gets, in a way, whether you realize it or not, you are inadvertently supporting Trump's policies, whether you realize it or not. And me, as an Iranian who has a semi-larger profile, who teaches in academia, like I have to guard against aiding and abetting the U.S. goal of imploding Iran, 100%. 100%. Now, I've done my duty as a historian by chronicling a very sensitive history that the Iranian government does not want told. I've done that duty. But as an American who lives here, as a taxpayer here, who knows, who believes that the U.S. government is trying to employ Iran, um, that may lead to the dismemberment of the country, um, I feel like we have to be critical of the United States first and foremost. It's policy, not its flag or its constitution or its culture or where we grew well, up or any of that, but it's foreign policies vis-a-vis -vis Iran and the Middle East and not to aid and abet it. So in a way, you're, you, you are saying you're doing it as a strategy, but you're honest enough to admit to that, right? It's like you're doing it by design. And I, think, I think we have to be really cautious. Right. Um, like right now, right now, when the Iraq war happened. Well, I get it. It's a power thing. And, the Iraq, and, and, when the Iraq war happened. Right. The Bush administration, when it was trying to sell the war to the American population that was skeptical, what it did was it took Iraqis who were also pro-war, who hated Saddam Hussein, Iraqis who were pro-war, who hated Saddam Hussein. They brought them in front of the cameras with their Iraqi accents that made them sound more authentic and said, we want America to save us. They will be welcomed as liberators, right? Now, I'm not being paraded on camera. Iran Some Iranians in the United States are right mm, now, right? Yeah. But when I post a tweet that can be interpreted as legitimating America's foreign policy against Iran, that to me is like being an Ahmed Chalabi Iraqi in 2003, going on TV saying, help us, save us. I'm not going to do that. Mm. Mm. I think we have, to be, we have to understand what's happening in the Middle East and in Iran, and we have to really realize that being critical of U.S. foreign policy is not only something we should do as Iranians, but as an Americans. Back I, about I, it, on that kind of, it's on funny. Russia. I kind of get what he's saying because I feel the same way about sometimes saying stuff that would make me f seem... Like right now, that's why I give a disclaimer about Qasem Soleimani or certain things because like, I don't want people... Think like, oh, so you support the Iranian government. Like, so I'm talking about my fans, Iranians. I don't want them to get the wrong idea. So I kind of get it. Like, sometimes like, you got to, like, I don't know. I think, that's a, yeah, I think that's a very black and white way they, they look at things. Well, yeah. But they the see a I criticism as like, oh, then you must support this. If you, yeah. if you criticize this, then you must support this. Is there one positive thing about, like, the Iranian government? Or, like, or in, in, not even the government, but right now, like, let's say, like, America did this and they shouldn't have done it to, to Iran. Then, uh, okay, then you're like, oh, you're... No, yeah. I mean, look, this is the way I, I'm, I'm hearing it. Um, say when I'm sitting with a couple 
and, and therapy and the husband, for whatever reason, he's being abusive. And if I just sit there and be like, let me be neutral or let me be 50-50 about it, that woman will get beat that night. Yeah. <clears throat> so that's the point of view that I feel like you're coming from. And I was curious by it, right? Um, so I kind of understand it better. And thank you for giving me an honest response. It's a good it question. Is design. I appreciate yeah. that. Um, to the people that follow me um, and watch this episode, I don't have the muscle to go back and forth uh, with political points. So, um, you know, I couldn't create too much of a debate type of a environment. And I don't think I'm even embracing that energy anymore. So I just want to be transparent for the people that like me and, and depend on me to be able to talk in a way that creates some sort of a duality where opinions can go back and forth. I think you're not in many ways, my questions may have, and I'm sorry to cut you off, have almost put Puya in a place where he can even shine more. And I'm aware of that. Um, yeah, I, don't, I, was, I, I don't was hold gonna any... say that myself. Like right. your, your Zen presence and even your you did ask some really good questions, created the space, and same with Erfan, right. created the space for me to be m much more open than I was last time. And yeah. I appreciate you saying that and mm -hmm. thank you for saying that. And the other thought that came to my mind is that perhaps maybe we can bring somebody on the show that may have opposite views and that could be our way of honoring different point of views. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be me going back and forth because I'm not knowledgeable, educated in that regard. And frankly, um, that's not the place I'm at these days. I love you all. I love you, Puya, for coming in. Thank my you pleasure. for the drive, for man. And thank you for answering my questions sometimes when um, <laughs> I'm in a difficult place. My pleasure. Thank you all for tuning in. Thanks for coming, Puya. Always good to see you. Uh, Nomad out. <laughs> Mm-hmm, 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 mm-hmm.